like to read out of a, the passage uh, this morning of choice out of Psalms 37, 3 and 5. I don't know if I gave this particular passage. Yes, I did to our guys back there. Please try to catch up with me. Uh, I left some things undone and none said to you, so I trust that you'll uh, uh, keep up with me. Out of Psalms 37, 3, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take the light in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, if the whole world understood the plan of God and how the Lord situated things, we have so much need in our country. We have so much need around the world, so much need in our personal lives. If some of us would just take the time to read out of the scripture and listen to the promises of the Lord, we'd find that the Lord gives solution to our desires. And I'm reading it right now out of Psalms 37 and 3. You might want to jot that down to read it at home, put it on your refrigerator, or, or write it down somewhere at your workstation at work. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. Everybody say, trust in him. Trust in him. Say it like you understand what I'm telling you. Trust in him. And he will do this. Put your hand on your heart as we pray. Father, I pray for this word, Lord, this morning. I do everything I can, Father, in my ability, Father, to convey this message. And that which I can't, Father, I trust that by your Holy Spirit you would just sink this word, Lord. That you would engrave this word deep in the wells of our hearts for every listener, every believer. And those who need Christ this morning, Father, wake us up to the reality that a Savior is born and you're here for us. And we want to be here for you. Teach us, Father, to trust and wait on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I've titled my devotional this morning, not knowing how much time I had after all these uh, dramas that we had. And it seems like I do have a little bit of time. But at, at any rate, I'm not going to go any further than what I have. At least we'll give you an opportunity to share this morning. We have some refreshments and some goodies for you after the service. Maybe it'll be a good time after the service to meet somebody, to fellowship, and, and just wish them a happy birthday. I was reading uh, this past week, and according to some surveys, it's because of all the luxuries that we have in our country. Uh, they find that because we are a people of such resources here in these United States and really around the world in many places, they, they, they did a study that it's because of what we possess and we're able to do on our own that we have become a very impatient people. That we have become a people who are incredibly impatient about anything and everything in life. Can I get a witness this morning? I should raise my hand. I need to be honest from this holy pulpit. Impat patience is not something that I've mastered yet. So those interviewed and surveyed were asked to be honest and even precise to the timing of how long it took for them to become impatient and cause them to respond to the impatience they were experiencing to the second, if you will, and uh, concerning several things in their lives. For example, some reported being frustrated after 16 seconds of waiting for a web page to open. Absolutely frustrated. Some said after 25 seconds of waiting for a traffic light to change, they became impatient and began to speak against the city and all the people that handle the lights. 
It only takes some said 22 seconds for people to start cursing their computers or TVs if the show they're watching doesn't immediately buffer or stream correctly. Some also reported losing their cool after 18 seconds for searching for a pin. I don't know about you, but I normally find those on my ear. After I've yelled and screamed at my wife, where did it happen to my pin? And she looks at me, she goes, have you tried your left ear? Even for a cup of tea, some say it incited anger. If it took the kettle more than 28 seconds to boil. Incredible. These are actual true surveys. You can find them on George Barna's studies I'm, and other people that uh, survey uh, people over certain things they're interested in. Others said that they were especially annoyed and frustrated after spending just a few seconds on a line at the grocery store that doesn't move as fast as they wanted to. Someone said it's just the time to wait is excessive. But the question is, what really do we consider excessive waiting? Well, again, others said 30 seconds of waiting in line would be enough for, to test their patience and they move to another line at HEB or at the grocery store. Impatience. Impatience. But of all the people, here's the funniest thing of it all, of all the people that were surveyed, then they asked a general question at the end of their survey and their honest responses. They said, tell me something that you believe concerning patience. They said, well, we believe that really patience is a virtue. After saying that it took them 16 seconds to get angry at the teapot and it took them this many seconds waiting for the microwave not to ding and prepare their food, they said, Patience is truly a virtue. You know, when it comes to patience, ladies and gentlemen, in this world, it is actually one thing. But when it comes to patience in our walk with God and relation to God, we are commanded to be a patient people. The book of James chapter 5 and 7 speaks to us about the necessity of being patient, and it gives us farmers as examples. You see the farmer, how he plants his seeds, and he waits patiently for his crop. Learn to be patient. It teaches us to be patient and be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in petition and prayer, that we should take things before God and just embrace patience. So why would the Bible, why would God's word recommend or give such a commandment or recommendation to us? Because waiting can really offer us a great benefit. When you look at patience honestly through the eyes of God, there is purpose for patience in our lives. For example, being patient can teach us to learn to be happy. When things aren't moving as fast as we'd like them. Often it's the opposite. It makes us unhappy because things aren't moving as fast. But if you pay attention to the virtue of patience, it could teach us to conform and to learn to be happy in spite of us out being out of control of how fast we want things to move. Other times being patient and waiting can teach us how to trust and surrender ourselves to God's timing, teaching us that we ultimately aren't in control of the second hand or the minute hand or the hour hand in our day. We have no control over those things. So it teaches us to trust and surrender. Another virtue that waiting and patience can teach us is it can teach us to prepare for whatever it is that we're waiting for. It gives us time to get things ready and wait as we're waiting to wait upon the Lord to allow these things to happen. It gives us a chance to prepare. We're waiting for answered prayer 
answered provision, answered healing or direction, we can learn to trust and prepare for the perfect ways of God and allow him to do things according to his time and will. When we talk of time, minutes, hours, and days, and years, Scripture speaks of them in a different fashion. When it comes to time in Scripture, ladies and gentlemen, again, I say to you, it's all in relation to God's purpose. How I pray that even me, as I walk with God, I would learn that on a daily basis, to learn that when God allows certain things to happen immediately, it's because it's his perfect timing for that. But if he allows things to wait and to hold off, that we would always consider that it's our lives in his hand, just like the psalmist said. To know that it's God's perfect timing that will always allow things to work out perfectly in our lives. You see, the fact is that the impatient people have learned or failed to learn that everything is subject to God's timing. The Bible says in Colossians 1 and 16 that all things visible and invisible were created by him and for him here on earth and under the earth. The rulers and powers all were for him and by him. Timing. Timing. See, in the Bible, we learn that waiting and being patient to receive those things from God always brings good fruit. The Bible says that in the right time, God sent his son just at that perfect time. And did you know that they were waiting for him for thousands of years? They had received the promise in the garden. And thousands of years had passed and people that heard that promise, some waited, some did not. But the time came, as we saw this morning displayed through this drama, the time came that God's perfect timing brought us his son. The Bible teaches us concerning timing that God came to Moses one day to deliver his people just at the right time. If you read the book of Acts, chapter 2, you'll find that just at the right time, the Lord sent his Holy Spirit. And those who were believing and trusting in him had already been waiting for over a month. Waiting on the Lord. The Bible speaks to us about waiting. Specifically, Ecclesiastics, chapter 3. Many of you have heard this passage, heard of this passage, or you've read this passage, but it's real. It's in the scripture. And it says, for everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to be born, and a time to die. The timing of God, the perfect timing of the Lord. The psalmist wrote in Psalms 31 and 5, my times, Lord, are in your hand. Waiting and patience, ladies and gentlemen, really reveal a lot about us and our walk with God. It does. It reveals a lot about who we are in character on the inside. When we are a people that are patient and we've embraced the waiting well, we see here that we understand that our confidence is not on us but on someone else. That our trust is in the Lord. If you wait patiently, you're revealing that there is a confidence in your heart that says, you know, it may not happen when I want it, but it will happen when God knows and appoints it. It reveals of us that 
We trust that God will accomplish what he promised he would do. We just read it in scripture. He said, trust in the Lord. He will do this. That promise that you received of the Lord this morning, that you've been waiting, that healing, the healing of the broken heart, the healing of a marriage or a family or whatever it might be that you're waiting for, trust in the Lord. He will do it. He will do it. When you've embraced waiting, it reveals that you understand that we can change nothing and hurry nothing. Nothing in our lives can be pushed forward. And therefore, we learn to rejoice and always allow God and not hinder what God wants to do, but allow God's perfect flow of things in our lives to come and take place. Isaiah 46 and 9 reads as follows. It's, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have proposed it. And the Lord says to us all this morning, I will do it. Do you know why Jesus came to us 2,000 years ago? Because God proposed it. You know why today we can celebrate the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, the growing up of his life, even the crucifixion and the giving of his life for us? Because God proposed it. It put it on his clock. He put it on his time. Christmas 2,000 years ago was all about the waiting. The origin of Advent, which means the arrival, is not necessarily written out clearly in the Bible, but from church history as early as the 4th century, we are told the waiting and the birth of Christ was waited upon. People received it in many ways, that promise, if you will. People responded to that promise in a lot of ways. Some people, we are told in Scripture, could not wait for the coming of the Lord. Therefore, they began to live their lives in their own ways. Others begin to function in this world by ignoring that promise. Yet others embrace the promise and continue waiting for the arrival of that promise. You see, the call of waiting in the Scripture, as it was for many of them in Scripture times, they lived out a life that they would call a life of intentional waiting. That means that they prepared to wait. They intentionally caused themselves to draw back from the rush and the noise and the stress of their lives with great anticipation for the gift of God, his son Christ. The people embrace waiting intentionally. And I believe that sometimes we lack in that area. We forget that waiting, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't come to us naturally. Waiting for us isn't something that just flows from us. Waiting is something we have to learn and act out premeditatedly. To say, you know, today I'm not going to hurry. I know I'm being impatient for this to happen. But I need to embrace, I need to teach, I need to train my heart to be patient. And make use of the virtue of waiting and patience in the Lord. It's, it's an art, ladies and gentlemen, that has given so many people so many positive things and so many wonderful things in the Lord. But yet it's robbed the people, those who have rejected it. It's caused them to lose so much in life. It caused them to lose so much of what God could have given them. But because of their impatience... 
they missed out on the timing of the Lord. The Hebrew and Jewish community in Bible times understood patience and waiting. It was almost 800 years before Christ was born that God has spoken through the prophets promising a day when the Messiah, the Savior, would come to deliver them. Isaiah chapter 9 reads of this particular promise. Isaiah 9 and 6, for, us, for to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he, his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And so when these people heard this promise, they embraced it as a faithful promise of God. And century after century, generation after generation, still there was no sign of this Messiah. And as with the people, even so today, they responded to this particular promise, like I said, in different ways. Some quit waiting on this promise and begin to live in the world, putting away all hope that Jesus would ever come. Others took it in their own hands, as we see in Scripture, claiming to be the Savior themselves. Let's create our own golden calf. Just like in the times of Moses when he went out to Mount Moriah to get the Ten Commandments as we know the story. Those that were waiting for this promise of God to come couldn't wait any longer. So what did they do? They built their own golden calf. And may I challenge you to the dangerous thought that in society today there are many people who have stopped waiting for God to move for God's return and have built their own golden calves here in this world, and they worship these golden calves. Let it be whatever it is that has taken their hearts. All because of impatience. All because of impatience. Impatience, ladies and gentlemen, please remember this, if anything else. Impatience is the friend of no one. Some of us have made tragic mistakes because of impatience. Some of us have made absolutely horrendous, unchangeable, irreversible things that we could never bring back because of our lack of being able to wait. And it applies in every, every area of life, all the way from marriage, impatience, all the way from starting a business, impatience, all the way from moving to another city or going to a college, going to a university or going around the world. Mistakes have been made horribly in these important things that take patience and time to wait upon the hand of God. It's in the waiting, ladies and gentlemen. It's in the waiting. Have you ever been in a situation where you've been forced to trust and wait on God? How did you do? How did you fare out? When you knew in your heart that you were supposed to wait for something, but yet you could not control the running wild of your thoughts and imaginations and strategies that you couldn't tame them. It caused you to move forward and do something that today you go, man... I can't believe I didn't wait. How did you fare out in that last important circumstance or situation in your life? See, for the Israelites, they continued to wait 400 years between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew. They call it that span of silence between the old prophet's book and the New Testament Matthew record. There was silence and yet... We know and we hear stories that people continually waited as they walked along the bridge of nothingness. That's such a lonely place, ladies and gentlemen, 
to walk on the bridge of nothingness, the, the bridge of deafness, the, the bridge of, uh, of silence. Because that's when your mind runs wild and your thoughts run and your creativity begins to just bloom. And it takes that specific individual that has grown in their trust of God to say, I've heard nothing, therefore I will move nothing. I wait upon the Lord. And they waited and they heard nothing until finally the silence was broken. When we heard of a man, John the Baptist, that would call the forerunner of Christ. He would be the first sign of the break of silence in Scripture. That would bring again, it would birth the great anticipation in the hearts of those that had been waiting all this time. They saw something finally break loose. John the Baptist came as a forerunner as we know his testimony. He came to prepare a way for this coming king that the world had been waiting for. Or at least a great margin of the world had been waiting for. Those who embraced waiting and patience were still waiting for this Messiah. He came as a forerunner to prepare a way. Now when we look at him being a forerunner, we, we understand that obviously a forerunner to us indicates that he came to speak about this coming Christ of whom he was not worthy to tie the strings of his sandals. But did you know that historically in principalities and kingdoms when the king was going to make a journey to another kingdom or another city or another place, they would send out forerunners and what these forerunners would do, they would plan out and sketch out The direction, or if you will, the way that the king would make his way through and to that place. And they would send out a big crew of people that would go and knock down trees. They would plow the ground. They would make a highway for the king to pass by so that he wouldn't be jumping over jagged edges and going under trees. Those were the forerunners of the kings. They would make a way for him so that when the king came in his golden chariot, uh, surrounded by those who would serve him, he would ride on level ground. And this is who John the Baptist was. He came to knock down the trees and take away the jagged edges and move the rocks away and plow the ground and make it soft for the horses and for his chariot so that the king of glory would make his way at his appointed time. The coming of Jesus had taken many through difficult times when it came to patience. Many went through, and all of them went through the corridor and the difficult corridor of waiting over thousands of years. And even though Many have concluded that the coming of Christ in this manger is a fulfillment of his final prophetic utterance. Ladies and gentlemen, please know that what you have seen here is simply one of the comings of the Lord. The advent of God in Scripture consists of three advents. The first advent, as all of us know, is what we are experiencing today. It was him being sent by his father to mingle with the sinful lives of men, you and I. To come into a world and offer this highway that John the Baptist had prepared, but for us to travel that we might be able to stand righteous before God once again. What we celebrate here right now is his first advent, the first coming of the Lord, if you will. The second advent is when he comes into our hearts. And this is so important because this has not happened to all the people in this world, but it's happened 
to many of us, and I trust that every one of us in this place have received Christ's second coming, if you will, and that second coming consisting of him coming into our hearts, first into this world, then into our hearts. And I ask you this morning the question of the hour. Has Christ been born in your heart today? Are you saved? Or are you like that innkeeper? That even though you know Christ has been sent into this world and people have been waiting for thousands of years for this to happen, they finally received him on the earth, but yet there was still someone like that innkeeper that said, we have no room for you. We have no room for you. Are you still saying like that innkeeper, you know, Pastor, I've been to church a lot of times and I've been to a lot of Christmas services and that question has been posed before, but no, nah, uh, you know, Jesus uh, is really not for me. So then he hasn't arrived into your heart, though he's been knocking. We're experiencing the first. It was up to God. Now we are called to experience the second, which is your call, to receive Christ as Lord of your life. Then there's a third coming. And that is one that we have not all seen today. And that is when the Lord will come to rapture his church. He came to the world as he promised and people waited. He's come to knock on the door of your heart and now he's waiting. He's coming. One day the Bible says in great glory to rapture his church and he wants us all to be waiting. Again for this third arrival no one knows the hour. But for those who believe in the prophetic utterances of the Lord, they know that the hour, just like when he came to Jerusalem that day, he will come in great glory in the clouds on that day as well. Can you say amen? amen. And it's a responsibility for every single one of us in this place who have received him here on earth and will receive him in our hearts today. Learn to wait. Learn to be patient. Because he said he's coming back. He's coming back. And just like, ladies and gentlemen, being patient teaches us many things. And learning to wait teaches us many things. Then I want to challenge you as I close this morning. In the midst of your very busy and cluttered lives, do you have time to wait for him? In the midst of your running back and forth, some of us are such busy bodies in the day. We've got so much to do. We've got a business to run. We've got children to take to school. We've got this and the other. We've got cleaning. We've got the office. We've got this and the other. Running back and forth. We've got college. We've got studies. We've got tests. We've got all these things. The question still remains, and I believe God asks us all, do you still have time to wait for me? Oh, you will, will you respond like many did that were waiting before he came even his first time and lose sight of that prophetic word, that promise of God that said, I will do it and go back to normal living forgetful of anything you have heard or received from the Lord. Well, how do I prepare? What do I do? Take this time of waiting, ladies and gentlemen, as we move on from Christmas. In the next few days, ladies and gentlemen, Christmas will be a has-been. It will be a past. It will be history. 
And the fact of the matter is there is no denying that life will call you back to the regular business hours. And this whole season, this whole time of really thinking about Christ and being involved all about the Christmas nativity scene and speaking about God, sending his son, all these things will get behind you. And for those of us who will allow it, will allow this whole experience of this next weekend too to just become faded into the woodwork of history in our lives. But yet we're called just like before he came to wait. We are called to learn to wait for his last appearance. This waiting, ladies and gentlemen, I pray you would learn to truly embrace. And how? Well, we can learn from the, big, the people in Scripture in the book of, uh, of Acts. Uh, there's testimony after testimony of what people did while they were waiting. They stayed active in reading God's Word. They stayed active in coming to the synagogue, going to church. They were active going to church. Please don't be offended, ladies and gentlemen. When I say that I dare someone, just one, don't be hurt with me, but this is a fact, and because I'm a herald of truth, I need to tell you some of us will only come to church in Christmas. We'll only come to church during times of festivities when my grandbaby is an angel, when my son is singing a song, when... My son-in-law is playing Jesus when the choir is involving my children. I'll come to church. That's not waiting. That's called forgetting. But the people in Scripture tells us that they were constant in reading God's word. They were constant in coming to church. They knew that the waiting involved coming to the fellowship and not missing service and being there, taking opportunity every time they could to worship God and praise his name and come corporately with a body to sing songs of glory and praise unto the Father who up to this day has fulfilled every promise he said. Oh, I wish I had a church in this house this morning. The time of waiting can involve, ladies and gentlemen, time of sacrificial living. It means learning how to give time to serve God. Learning how to serve others. We are here as Rock of Ages our greatest motivation next to worshiping the Lord, our greatest motivation, I say this to all of our visitors, we're here to serve you. We'll do the best we can to embrace you and to pray for you and encourage you. But you can do the same every day as we wait upon God. To learn to live sacrificial lives, to learn to care, to love others, to love our church community, to love our community around us enough to share Christ. We are told the church continually fasted. They were in fasting and prayer always. That's how we wait upon God. It's a God and the Lord did not come to create or establish a church that was nothing more than lethargic and just couch potatoes, if you will, sitting at home doing nothing. And let God just do everything. No, there is something that's always needed to be done, and God expects us to live a, an act, a life of activity, moving forward, proactive in the things of the Lord. Always work to do. Did you know, and I think I'm being generous in this particular statistic because I've not read it in a while, and I'm probably quoting a statistic of probably 15, 20 years ago, but the work of the church is done by no more than 15% of the church. 
That means if you have 100 people, only 15 people will do all of this. We'll do all the plays. We'll do all the music. We'll do all the cleaning. We'll do all the preparation. Or close to 80, 85% of the church will come and enjoy the sacrificial lives of others. Waiting. It's in the waiting. It's learning to be thankful on a daily basis, waking up, being, being thankful, being conscious that a man can receive nothing except it be given to him by God, knowing that even when you sit at the meal, don't take it like you've earned it, but take it like it's a gift of God and knowing that otherwise God had not intended you to be eating, you'd be somewhere without. To learn to be thankful. That's waiting. Waiting is always looking for a way to further the kingdom of the Lord. To always reach out to somebody and share Christ with them. To learn to be loving, be humble, fulfill the duties in our lives as we wait for Christ's return. That, ladies and gentlemen, will constitute active waiting. Premeditated waiting. And so this morning, Christmas, I could have spoken to you a lot about the nativity scene and the shepherds and the angel that came to Mary and what it might have been for Joseph, who was called to be the father of heaven's son. I could have spoken to you about Christmas trees and all the gifts and all the food and all the fun and all the family coming over for the weekend and how we should go out and just celebrate and all these things. But you know, my heart breaks, ladies and gentlemen. When we forget that this is not really about an extended weekend at work. It's not about the barbecue pit and I know you guys are phenomenal barbecue guys. It's not about the wonderful pastries our bakers will produce. It's not about, yes, it's a beautiful thing to see family from Chicago and California coming over. All these things are beautiful. But that's not the premise. That's not the foundation. That's not the woodwork. That's not the ground we stand on when we think about this season. It's a time to remind us. there's still a waiting that it's still in the waiting we can't keep Jesus in the manger I said we cannot keep Jesus in the manger as a matter of fact we cannot on Easter Sundays we cannot keep Jesus on the cross cannot keep him there he's not He's not in that manger. And he's not on the cross. He's waiting for the appointed time to meet us again. He's waiting for that time to come once again. But not in a manger. Not on a cross. But he's going to come as the king of glory. Hallelujah. And the angel will shout, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's not going to be away in the manger. Mm. Though I love that song and every song at Christmas just brings warmth to our hearts. I know. But on that day, if you're waiting, it's going to be a much grander day than anything we could provide for you as entertainment. The main actor there, the main artist there is going to be Jesus himself. The monologue that's going to be spoken is not going to be read by anybody, but it's going to be himself. The wardrobe will be special, and the theater, and the entrance, and the view of his kingdom is going to be more than any 
person could ever imagine. But it's in the waiting. And so this morning, what is keeping you from waiting? As we prepare our hearts, that we celebrate this coming Christmas next week or so, we celebrate the coming of this child, Christ, 2,000 years ago. There's something, first and foremost, we should all consider. And that is what's keeping us from waiting on Him. Maybe it's unconfessed sin from something in your life that's keeping you from waiting on him maybe there's areas of rebellion disobedience that are keeping you from finding peace with christ maybe there's unforgiveness something you need to apologize for to relieve your heart from certain things that's keeping you from really honestly waiting for the lord maybe it's an attitude that you have Maybe you need to learn how to be thankful. Maybe something in your life that might be hindering that perfect, anticipated, premeditated attitude of waiting. Get it out of your life today. And let us all today learn to wait on Him. Would you stand to your feet this morning? time is passing and the promise of his appearance in the heavens is going to be so much different than the appearing of him in the manger his promise to come into our hearts if we let him is here and now today but on that day the promise of him coming in glory is coming as he has chosen that appointed time I say to you this morning, regardless of where you find yourself, just like John the Baptist, let us be forerunners. Let us make a way for the Savior. As I said, those men that were assigned by the king as forerunners would go and take away trees and would level the ground and would make the place beautiful so the king could come in. You see, that morning, this morning for us, this could imply that there's some things that we need to remove from our hearts. Unlevel things in our lives that are not right, that are making you unhappy and separating you from the peace of God. There are things that you need to level out, the ground you have to tear up a little bit and soften up in your life to make way for the King of Glory. Let's do that today. Let's make